Hello, this is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoy this video. Good evening, everybody. This is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. Welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast. Fortunately, James couldn't make it this week, but our guest and topic tonight is going to be about Fail Better Games and a discussion on a very interesting narrative topic. We're going to be talking about the relationship between the player and the player character. Can the player be convinced to do something that may not be a their better nature if the character does it? And so are the challenges of pulling in the player into the world. But let's welcome our guest this week first. Please welcome from Fail Better Games, writer Cash to Cure. Hello, Josh. Thank you for having me on the on the show, on the podcast. Not a problem, here. Cash. It's great to have you on. I know we were speaking before the cast, but I think you are the third member from Fail Better Games to be on this cast. That seems to be so. Uh, Chris, our head writer, and Liam, our lead developer, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. have joined you previously. Yeah, and it's been a lot of fun. I think we're going to have another great conversation today. I certainly hope so. So, um, while we are recording this cast in early October, chances are, for those of you listening to this cast, it probably will be a few weeks later. So, we're going to try to time things around there, but we'll do our very best. So, I guess to begin with, Cash, since this is your first time on the cast, if you wouldn't mind telling everyone a little bit about yourself and kind of your role at Fail Better. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as, as you said, I'm Cash. I am a writer here at Fail Better. Uh, I am not uh, as English as many of my <laughs> uh, compatriots are. I've come from the good old USA, born and raised there. I moved uh, all around the country, studied, uh, well, writing uh, at college is what I wanted to, or at least those things which make up writing, uh, art, history, philosophy, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I knew I always wanted to be a writer. I happened to uh, start playing Fall in London right around the time they announced they were hiring for a writer. I managed to uh, work my way uh, through that application process for a couple of months, and here I am. Worked out quite happily. Awesome. How long have you been working at Fail Better for, Cash? Uh, nearly, nearly a year and a half by now. Cool. And for the people listening to the cast, what games have you either worked on or currently worked on at the moment? Fail Better is my first uh, job, mm-hmm. uh, certainly with a games company. And I am working between both Fallen London and Sunless Sea, particularly on the Submariner expansion coming out in just a few days or in the past few <laughs> days if you're listening to this later in October. Awesome. And I know... I've spoken to Chris and Liam in the past about Fallen London and Sunless Sea. I know Sunless Sea was very a very interesting game for Fail Better. It was, I think, the studio's first real, I guess, quote unquote, like action or more like player response game. Because I know yes. Fail Better has definitely made a name for themselves with narrative driven games, whether it's uh, Fallen London. And I know you guys have worked on, I think, a few other, I think, smaller browser-based games, too. Is that right? That's correct. In the the old days, well before I came, mm-hmm. um, but we're, we're strictly with uh, Fallen London, Sun the Sea right now. And mm-hmm. Sun the Skies uh, one day. Yes. Coming soon. And thanks for bringing that up, Cash, because we definitely have to touch a little bit on that. For those of you listening to this, Cash, right now, there were there was a brief announcement. I think it was... I think at the end of September, if I remember right. That sounds about right. That Fail Better is working on, this is going to be a full-on new game, right? It's not going to be like an expansion? It is going to be a whole new world, my friend, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sunless Skies, where you will be able to enter the avid horizon, is what we call it. (laughs) It's, It's not our typical space as we know it, which is, you know, this vast, empty vacuum. This is full of color and terror. Mm-hmm. And I still love the idea of from Sunless Sea that we call it the Untersea and not oh, the yes. Undersea. Oh yes, that's uh, the nautical Z as we call it. <laughs> it's an old joke on 
and some uh, foreigners, from what I understand. But <laughs> Now, obviously, as we're talking in early October, there's not much really concrete at the moment about Sunless Skies. And I know from the announcement, you guys are planning a second Kickstarter for that one. Is that right? That's correct. Sometime in February is what we're going for. Oh, good. That'll be right around time for my birthday, too. <laughs> Happy Happy birthday! <laughs> very early there, but yeah, happy thank you. <laughs> very early birthday. You listen to this on your po- on your uh, mm-hmm. on your birthday again. Mm-hmm. There you go. They're all sorted. Yeah, and when the time comes, I would definitely like to talk to you guys at Fail Better again, regarding more about planning the Kickstarter as well, because it's always fascinating to hear sort of the challenges and the um, thinking and coordination that goes into running a Kickstarter. Now, yes, I-, um, I guess for you, Cash, since you just you joined Fail Better about a year ago. I think that was after the Sunless Sea Kickstarter, right? It was indeed. And so I guess as a quick aside then, as an, I like to ask all of our guests, especially members of the game industry, this question, what do you think about sort of the Kickstarter crowdfunding phase we're really in when it comes to game development these days? I think it is a wonderful thing. I mean, I, I have to. I would not be here right now if it were not for Kickstarter. Uh, Transform, the company, really gave us a shot to mm-hmm. make a, a game people have really responded to very positively, critics and uh, fans alike. Yeah. And I think it, I mean, every system is always going to be open to abuse or misuse. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are always going to be unhappy incidents where things don't work out as as people hope um but i think if you give it to the hands of the right people mm-hmm. um it, it, it can really be a, a great boon to the arts on the whole really and i know we uh, strive particularly to make sure that all of our promises um are always met and we're always striving to be very transparent about the process so i know we'd be glad to talk to you about mm-hmm. that uh when the time comes awesome and again I think you had a really good point there, Cash. I, what we're seeing, especially with like the Kickstarter, even stuff like Early Access, and recently, or recently in terms of recording time, with Steam reviews and only mm-hmm. allowing people who buy on Steam to review those games, there's definitely been a few Ryan Apples when it comes to any of these things. And I think part of the challenge is definitely proving to the consumer that you are you know, on the up and up. But I think, as you said, it has definitely opened up the door for a lot of games we would not have seen otherwise. Just so. Now, going back to Fail Better and your role there, as we say, your position is, I think you said, narrative designer or writer. And Mm -hmm. I guess for people listening to the cast, so what would, I guess, kind of be like your day-to-day work at Fail Better? Oh dear, well it depends <laughs> as much on the day as anything else. I could be anywhere between writing uh, the content of a story. We do very prose heavy games, mm-hmm. very uh, word heavy games. And I could, I could be writing out um, those stories. I could be uh, doing QA work on another. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I can give you a brief glimpse of our, our entire process mm-hmm. if, if that would be yeah. helpful. Um, cause usually I'm involved at one or the other point of this. So, uh, either we will be given a spec of a story we are to write, or else we will propose one. And this will be an outline of how the story is going to play out in branches and qualities. Um, some, let's see, and follow London both follow uh, the same system. They use, they work in Story Nexus, mm-hmm. which is a system where you enter what we call a storylet. You'll see several branches. Um, the storylet will describe the basic action of what's going on. Maybe you're entering a fine parlor and then you'll have branches which represent what you could do in that parlor. Maybe you want to seduce the heiress or you want to uh, poison the drink of the duke mm-hmm. or you want to do any of all, uh, anything really. Mm-hmm. Um, our budget in that respect is uh, limitless. Um, but we'll figure out what's the best way to tell uh, a narrative from A to B, to C, to D, to E, and all the way down to the last letter Mm -hmm. and get the player. So we'll build a uh, small model of that in our system. We'll build a skeleton to play through if it works, if it's feeling good. Mm -hmm. Um, Design will give a few notes on feedback 
then we'll go out to write the whole bloody thing. Mm -hmm. um, we'll fill that out. We'll expand it. We'll fix the problems along the way. Mm -hmm. It'll go through another two uh, phases of testing. Content QA will come in. We have a very fine edi editor, Olivia Wood. Mm -hmm. um, or it will go to maybe uh, James Chu to go through the testing phase of if it's broken in any way mechanically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's off to final polish and review. And that tends to be what I do. I'm either planning how stories are going to work in terms of quality and timing and player experience, or I'm out there making it or polishing them up. Cool. Um, one question for you, Cash. When you guys are in the preliminary phase of like testing a story mm -hmm. and stuff like that, are you testing it like in terms of like a like, narrative point of view, like if the story flows? Is it more of like a gameplay? Like, is this something that would be interesting, or is it like mm -hmm. a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both, and certainly it also depends on which uh, title you're referring to. I mean, we look for different mm -hmm. things in Sun the Sea and in Fallen London. They're very different uh, yeah. to write from, one from the other. Fallen London being mostly an action-based where we have timed actions, so we can really pace it quite mm -hmm. easily around that, even though we do often want to give players um, mm -hmm. as, as much to do in a story as we can. Uh, so we try and make content as engaging and uh, as as possible, and sometimes maybe that can feel a bit too grindy. So we'll we'll take back on that. Mm -hmm. Or in uh, Sunless Sea, uh, we have to be sure that the economy is balanced. We have to make sure that they are mm -hmm. asking something reasonable of the player at the given stage they would be in, and make sure, as you said, it, it feels fun to play. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not railroading the player down a track that they might not want to go, that it's not forcing them into situations that aren't really of their choosing, that they do have that sense of freedom mm -hmm. and also that it is enjoyable. Yeah, and as you were saying, Cash, with Sunless Sea, there is also the added mechanics of the fact that the game is played in real time, while Fallen London is more of the narrative, text-driven game. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to Sunless Sea... As you're saying, you also have to balance the fact that, you know, there's any combat, what's the player's, like, sh what kind of ship the player has right now, and as you're saying, with the economy as well. And that brings up another interesting point. I guess this can also, I'm sure there's a second answer for Fallen London. In terms of, I guess, writing a story for, like, different stages of, like, the player's progress, you know, something for someone who just started playing the game, Versus someone who's been doing this for, who knows, like 15, 20 hours. Mm -hmm. does, how does that change the writing process or the design process when you're coming up with these stories? Well, I think the most interesting and difficult point uh, out of that is uh, Fallen London characters uh, don't mm -hmm. tend to be played for 15, 20 hours, but for months and years. And they can grow mm -hmm. quite powerful over that time. Um, mm -hmm. They can be the most deadly, charming, shadowy, <laughs> dangerous uh, individual in the Neath. And so sometimes it does enter into interesting territory. Um, this is something we talk about a lot in-house in our exceptional friend stories, which is monthly content for our uh, premium mm -hmm. subscribers, where we have to give everyone a story who could either be at that very top tier or else really just starting their time in London and in the Neath. And it becomes a question of how do you balance those two. And the way I think we have found is that we balance it not through what the player is able to do in, in any given story, um, but rather through the story itself, if that makes sense. But what I mean is to say that uh, situations arise around the player and these are situations which could arise around uh, a player of any kind um in the story i've i've just written for example um where you and i must go you have met a severe blue jacket uh, an old sailor who has mm -hmm. asked you to sail all the way north to find a living iceberg known as a lifeberg and you have to dock there and you're looking uh through a wreck which was left there you're looking for a corpse in the wreck and along the way, you are, are tasked with 
caring for your crew. They don't want to be there. You can try and keep them calm, but you you can also stay on the track and and learn its secrets. There's more going on than you may have at first uh, been given to understand. Uh, and it, it becomes a question of what are these situations we are thrusting a player into rather than how are we going to let them necessarily explore the heights of their power. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really interesting point there, Cass, especially when you have games like Sunless Sea and Fall London that there are definitely player base has certainly grown with those games. I guess I'm not sure if you would know this or there's been if you've been keeping track of this, but I guess like for you guys at Fail Better, how many like stories do you like typically <laughs> like write in like a given period oh, for dear. these games? <laughs> oh god, I I have I do not know how to answer that. <laughs> um every month we are coming out with an exceptional story. Um, mm-hmm. That's a given. That's guaranteed. We are also coming out with. Uh, I can't. I can't say what we have coming up. You understand. <laughs> uh, but this the year alone, uh, we added a a couple of new stories for London. and I can't remember how many. But I know that we have been revamping quite steadily all of our holidays in in Fallen London. Indeed, we added an election for the mm-hmm. mayor of London, <laughs> um, which which went over very well. Um, mm-hmm. and, but uh, Zubmariner, of course, has, has taken up a lot of time. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I know how many ports. I think we've got at least a dozen ports in Zubmariner. I know mm-hmm. we've added early game quests. I've worked on a couple of those. We've added interactables. You can find interesting wrecks on the Z floor or other horrible things um, <laughs> that you can kill or be killed by, as the case may be. And mm-hmm. it's it's just an ever-turning wheel. Like, I don't have time to, to keep track of it myself. <laughs> now, here's a question for you, Cash, I'm kind of curious about from a writing point of view. With your own background as a writer and joining Fail Better and working on both Sunless Sea and Fall in London... Have you, like, I guess, had to, like, change your own writing style or adapt to them? Or have you managed to sort of add your own kind of, like, personal style when you're coming up with these stories and situations? I think the answer is always going to be both. Whenever you start to write for a company or for a universe, you are always going to have to abide by the rules established. Uh, Otherwise, it's going to break the experience. Players are going to wonder why you're all of a sudden... Um, you know, using American spellings um, in in this very British game or why you are um, maybe making some pop culture reference that's a a bit out of character or um, playing to one sensibility over another. Um, With that said, though, I, I, I think it's always going to be the case that writers will have their voices come out. Uh, it can't be helped. Um, whether or not that's always going to be distinguishable um, mm-hmm. is one thing or another. But, I mean, my writing is certainly very different from Chris's. And Chris's writing is certainly very different from James's. And all of us are very different from M. Short, one of our great contributors, or Richard Cobbert, or um, mm-hmm. any of the other hosts of them. And if we were to look at the content, we may be able to uh, easily identify who wrote what. Um, but... Mm-hmm. It's it's not something that's always going to be noticed by the player, but uh, it's it's always going to be mm-hmm. both worlds where you enter into uh, a style, but you bring your own flair and panache to it. Mm-hmm. Now, as you said, um, the process behind writing for both Fall in London and Sun in the Sky, because the games are two very different beasts, definitely affects what what and how you're writing for them. Do you have a preference for which game you're you prefer writing for or is it just that you, like it's there's no contest they're both good for you? I couldn't I couldn't choose one child over the other. <laughs> um they're very different challenges. Mm-hmm. I think that you can more easily write a narrative in Sunless or in Fallen London, um, because that tends to be focused strictly and solely in London, and you 
can really play around the city. You have more assumptions of what the character may or may not know. You mm-hmm. can much more easily with the action timer as well pace the story uh and because it does again just take place in london strictly and solely mm-hmm. you are able i think to how to say it um tell a more personal story you're able to focus on smaller sections of the world and because of that you're able to build up fall in london into the weird and wonderful city it is whereas mm-hmm. in sunless um, Sunless Sea in Zabmana. I've written a couple of ports for that. And that's more about creating a sense of place. And there are stories certainly within those places, but you need to write them around these interesting happenings that are going elsewhere in the world. Uh, I, I mentioned the economy earlier. That's one of the more mm-hmm. particular things about Suddenly, see for me uh, is that one means we have of pacing the game is by referring players back to the economy. Um, you have to bring in certain items in order to help out uh, this sprightly visionary as he's laying wire around the city, or you have to have wine to calm down uh, this man who's panicking over the terrible truth he found <laughs> out about the beast. Or you have to visit another port because if it was simply a matter of clicking through all of the storylets and through all of the branches in a port, uh, players would finish them in no time at all. So we have to find much more nuanced ways of creating their story and letting them live them. Mm-hmm. I think it's very interesting, Cash, what you just said regarding like the difference between the two kind of storytelling devices while Fall London allows you to tell this very more intimate story, more personal about the player's character, while Sun the Sea is more about the world and creating these interesting places, people, and situations. I've been wanting to have a discussion about sort of the challenges of writing these stories, you know, like the narrative pitfalls that mm-hmm. can happen. And I'm sure that could easily, if we get on that topic now, that would easily take us to like the hour probably beyond. I think so. But uh, what I find fascinating is that, as uh, this is probably another tangent, about some of the challenges when it comes to writing these stories. We've seen a lot of video games go for the, as you know, the epic, you must do this or the world will end, time will stop, mm-hmm. everything will die, blah, blah, it's blah. It's going to be the great meteor moon come crashing down. I love Majora's yeah. Mask, so that's probably <laughs> not the best example, but yes, absolutely. And then we have stories where it's more on the personal side, where if you fail, the world doesn't stop, but your personal world may. And we see this a lot as we're talking, it's October, so it's Halloween Horror Month, but we definitely see a lot with horror games, where, you know, stuff like the Silent Hill series, for instance, Mm -hmm. if you fail, the world, you know, everyone's going to keep going around their normal business, it's just that you personally are going to be screwed and yes. killed and all that. And I think when it comes to writing these stories, that I, the ones that I deal with more on the personal layer seem to, I think, resonate more with the player. I guess from your point of view and your position as a writer, would you agree with that or disagree, Cash? I think that makes sense. I mean, I think there's always a risk that's run when you do uh, – Go too big with things. Um, like mm-hmm. Bayonetta, for instance. I get another game I adore. I think its aesthetic is extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, yeah. The music as it plays, you know, buy me to the moon. It's, <laughs> oh, don't I'm, start singing that. I'm going to start singing that it's, now. It's one of my great joys. And yet, mm-hmm. of course, as much as I'm on a high octane trip, as I'm running down to kill God, quite mm-hmm. literally, um, it is a very enjoyable, but it's not as intimate. It's not as personal. Uh, I don't think it's at all, of course, trying to be. Uh, the question is, is can you have a melodrama, uh, a melodrama epic uh, that, that is painful? I, I think maybe the word we're, we're, we're looking for, at least the one I'm considering now, one that kind of guts you a little bit as you recognize that all is not well. And mm-hmm. if I don't really... You know, take care of this. It won't be uh, heavy rain. Uh, is a game that has been bandied about back and forth, praised and uh, mm-hmm. cursed uh, 
<laughs> quite often. But I found that some of the most intense moments of my uh, gaming career, my time in games, um, certainly came from that. And I, I never had anything akin in uh, the new Doom, for sake of argument. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially when we talk about writing in games, that's a very fascinating topic. And again, that could easily be several podcasts, mm-hmm. my live show, and probably several of my daily videos all wrapped up together mm-hmm. just talking about that one topic. And the idea of writing for games, I think, has certainly evolved, especially over the last decade, as the video game industry definitely moved towards more of the cinematic, more towards the storytelling, rather than just having stories... Um, I, I think we all know your princess is in another castle. Mm-hmm. Are you a bad enough dude to save the president? <laughs> stuff like that. And it's still when come. And this is one of those very weird things when we talk about the video game industry. I mean, in terms of what we consider to be uh, the video game industry, we're pretty much about right now just over like 20 years. No, I'm sorry. About 30 years in terms of like the revival from Nintendo and then when we're talking about storytelling that's still maybe only like 10 15 years where mm. things really started to get serious and just like with everything else there it's still very much in its infancy and it's kind of interesting when we're talking about this like like games like Fall in London Sunless Sea Heavy Rain Metal Gear you name it these kinds of games have been focusing more on the narrative side. There's still a lot of discussions about, you know, what we're able to write for, what we're able to talk about mm-hmm. when it comes to these games. Now, I'm sure this will probably segue us in a few minutes into talking about our topic regarding the player and the player character interacting with each other. Right. I guess um, before we get to that, because, again, that will probably take us to the end of this cast, Mm -hmm. I do want to just briefly finish touching on Sunless Sea and, of course, the Zubmariner. I'm (laughs) not going to be able to pronounce that thing. Zubmariner. Thank you. (laughs) Zubmariner expansion. Because, as we've said, by the time you're listening to this cast, it should be out for, as we're talking right now, it will be out in a few days. So... Obviously, um, we'll talk more about the story because I think that will all wrap up into our next topic. But speaking specifically about Zubmariner, what I know when I spoke with Liam about this, I think it was last year, I mm-hmm. think at this point. For people listening to this cast, what is the expansion going to do for Sunless Sea? Oh dear, hopefully uh, be <laughs> a little more terrifying than the game already is. Um, in uh, Zubmariner, you will finally have the chance to go under the waves. Uh, oh, there's a helicopter coming overhead. I'm not sure you can hear that yeah, straddling I, I, my I windows, can. but sorry about that. Um, there's an agreement about nothing of consequence, which is held by the powers of the Neath, that is London, the Connate, and the Presbyter. Uh, they say that there's absolutely nothing to worry about down there, and they're all going to go about their business, and they're all of them lying. Uh, everyone is vying for to court the powers down below, and there are several cities down below which hold uh, terrors and wonders, uh, both often indistinguishable from one another. And the player will have the chance to not only go down and you know explore these cities, learn uh, their truths, and enjoy their pleasures, uh, but also there there may be a chance to find your own immortality. Um, there, there are whispers of seven who once rose up against a, a great and terrible tyrant, uh, who once stormed a mountain where uh, immortality is kept. And as you go below the waves, you may be able to, uh, find out a little bit more about them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I am sure that there won't be any mention of Lovecraftian creatures or any eldritch kind of things under the waves, right? Well, I mean, it's you know <laughs> not like there's a city built on the back of a beast, which might. Uh, well, I don't want to give too much away, but <laughs> you'll you'll see for yourself. <laughs> From a gameplay point of view, with the Zubmariner expansion, how are you guys introducing the concept of? 
using like zubs and going under the waves from a, I guess, mechanic point of view? Well, it's quite simple. You uh, begin a quest to mm-hmm. get this submarine. You will acquire it. Uh, not too, not too uh, late into the game. It's, it's fairly early on. And once that is yours forever, you'll be able to uh, use it at your leisure. Uh, it will have the power to transform your ship into a submarine. It's very advanced nice. technology. And you can do that anywhere in open water. And you will be able to uh, go around, find cities, find wrecks you can explore, find even worse beasties. There may be uh, some jet streams you can hop on, speed up your journey if you're going a certain way. But it will be very neatly integrated uh, in uh, Liam and Mac have done exceptional work on that front. Yeah, And that definitely sounds like a very good idea in terms of adding new content to a game like Summer Sea. When we see expansion level content for games, it typically either falls into extending the game, you know, adding Mm -hmm. five to ten hours at the end, or goes the supplemental route with either like a new system or new mechanics that will sort of fold into the basic game. Mm -hmm. We've seen this with stuff like the expansions for XCOM, Renowned Explorers, and even like the older Civilization games. Right. And... I think for a Mariner, having this kind of just essentially a, become a part of the world that's already there, I think it's sure to extend and add more variety to the game. I think it absolutely will. I've uh, been playing through it, testing some uh, overarching content. I can't say too much about that. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. But it, it's it's looking beautiful. The experience is one I'm very proud to have played a part in. So. Mm-hmm. I guess here's a dumb question for me. When you transform into the Zub and mm-hmm. you go under the waves, are you still playing like the same top down view Absolutely of Absolutely. Yep. It's All the right. exact same top down view, except now you're under the waves and everything is dark around you. You have a little bit of light emanating from your submarine. You uh, have uh, some sense of what's going around you, and you have a zonar uh, pinging <laughs> out. Mm-hmm. But uh, even though you can pick up on those pings and you'll see um, some uh, some sparkles, I think it is some bit dizzy right now, but I, I think that's how it comes out. Uh, in the darkness, you're never quite sure what it is until you go up to it. And it could be a nice wreck, it could be some treasure, or it might be the constant companion comes skittering up <laughs> slowly at first, but now he's right on your tail. So. Mm-hmm. Are you able to resurface at any time, or is there like a cooldown? Or okay, yeah. yeah, just wanted to make sure. So if you go down, there's like you're completely surrounded. It's like okay, let's get back up. Yeah, there. it'll no. take you seven seconds, I think, and it'll oh. <laughs> cost you every hit you take in that time. So do be careful. In terms of, I guess, integrating with the Sunless Sea experience that's already available. Does the Submariner expansion add like new resources, new gear, new ships, anything like that? I don't believe it does. I haven't been too much on that front. I could be wrong, and I am going to be quite sad if I am, but I, <laughs> I don't think it adds any new ships, certainly. Uh, new mm-hmm. gear, certainly new qualities for the player to pick up, but uh, I don't mm-hmm. think it plays in, into that role as such. All right. Let me see here. I know this is one of those times I think we could easily spend who knows how many hours talking. But for those of you listening, of course, Cash is in London. I believe that's five hours ahead of me right now. It is indeed. So if we don't move on to our final topic, we'll easily approach hour two, maybe hour three or four on this cast. Mm -hmm. But to wrap up, I guess, briefly talking about Submariner. As we said, we are recording this cast before the game, is, before the expansion is released. So by the time people are listening to this cast, it should be out. My question for you, Cash, is for people listening who want to pick this up, how much is the expansion going to be? The expansion is going to run you roughly. Let me pull this up. I do should know. <laughs> I should know. I think it's going to be about £10 or $10, roughly. All right. And as with Sunless Sea itself, 
are you, is Fail Better planning on, of course, adding more stories and more content in the coming months after the release? Uh, there's not something I could comment on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about gotcha. that. Gotcha. <laughs> not a problem. So, again, we could, we've could we definitely touched on a lot of interesting topics, and I'm sure any one of those could easily be the main topic or the one we'll spend the majority of the cast on. But let's get back to talking more about narrative, because, again, I think that is a topic ripe with discussions, and that will easily, I think, take us to the end of this cast. So, getting back to what we were saying a few minutes ago, especially with building these stories and what we were saying before we switch over was sort of talking about the difference between personal stories versus the epic world universe yes. all time stopping storylines yes and i think one thing that i wanted to touch on that you mentioned a few minutes ago cash was regarding I guess limiting yourself as a writer and how certain fields may be easier or harder to write about. And it's one of the things that I've been thinking about and I may dedicate one of my critical thoughts or daily video or daily vlogs to this. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with sort of these narrative, I think, pitfalls or traps that some writers can fall into. And I think one of them has to be, again... It's kind of hard to explain, but I guess the difference between having a constraint, you know, being in a real world setting Mm -hmm. versus the fantasy, you know, we have magic, we have giant robots, Mm -hmm. we can go back in time, we can do all this. And I guess as a writer yourself, Cash, when it comes to stories that are dealing with the fantasy or science fiction elements, when you don't have the limits of real life constraining you. Are those stories, are those tales like harder to write when it comes to making something interesting and engaging to the audience? I don't think they they have to be by any means. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, another tool in the tool set. I think you can tell a very intimate, very close story uh, that may be said in the future or include elements of um, science fiction, fantasy, any of that. Um, it, it depends on how loudly you play your instrument or how uh, subtly, shall we say. Uh, by way of example, if I, if I can talk about uh, one of the ports in Submariner I wrote, uh, Rack, which is, I, I, I think, a, a particular uh, peculiar city in that it is... The city of wreckers, so these are individuals who are living in wrecked ships and the way they survive is by wrecking more ships to add to their city, to add to their population, to add uh, to their supplies of fuel and food. Um, and there grows in rack a peculiar weed on some of the ships that uh, if ingested will give you a bodily experience of living another's life. Uh, sometime in the past, sometime in the present, or sometime in the future, depending. And what uh, this evolves into, I, I hope players will pick up on, I hope they'll they'll experience it in this way, is uh, what I would call a, a quiet story. It's an intimate one between yourself and the fair king of Rack, who, as soon as he sees you, has a, a quiet moment of going, you know, oh, oh my god, I, I know you, you may not know me but take tether and and you'll you'll understand and as you do you have visions of characters who act in very similar ways to the fair king and it's uh this strange question of are you do you do is there something between you on a sort of cosmic scale is there why do you keep seeing each other in these visions and uh through content through speaking to the fair king and experiencing more visions, working out what exactly is going on between you two. Um, I mean, it could have been, you know, fantasy records, uh, I, or, you know, other example, uh, there's the crotchety tobacconist in Rosegate who has fantastical cigars, uh, and his great ambition is to make a cigar you can light underwater. And he has failed at this for 20 years, and it has driven him insane. <laughs> and the lengths to which he goes are abhorrent. They're terrifying. Um, they're vicious and cruel. Uh, but, you know, 
do do you want to to help him? I mean, it's a silly story in its own right because he wants to light the Z on fire um, as as petty revenge. But I, I do think it does avoid being a simple joke through making it that intimate. You're working with him. You're working at with his apprentice. You're seeing the small things he does to further his ambitions. You're seeing the tiny steps that he takes to finish this cigar and these flavors and how insipid and cruel he can be. Uh, I think he's, he's a light, he's good fun, but he's, he's, he's mad. And Mm -hmm. how much do you want to participate in this? Um, So again, it's, it's just a matter of tools in the toolkit. Yeah. I think you made a really good point there, Cash, about the extent, the elements and such are in impacting or affecting the story. And we can see this in so many different examples. You can have a fancy setting, but magic and stuff like that may be more on the outskirts. So you can't tell mm-hmm. a personal story between two people while, you know, there could be this epic war of wizards and dragons yes, going on absolutely. around you. Same thing, um, I guess... Um, I guess one of the examples I've been watching lately would be like Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And I recently got into the show about, I think, a year, two years ago at this point. And one of the things that we see is that while the show plays around the use of time travel, you can go anywhere, anywhen in time and space. Once they arrive at these places, then the story becomes locked to this one setting. So the use of time travel is essentially the vehicle to get there, but the story isn't revolving around it. Yeah, so it should be a means, not an ends. Yeah. Well, not always. I mean, it depends on the story you want to tell. If you do want that, Mm -hmm. again, I'll point back to Bayonetta. Uh, That's an utter delight. Go for it. But know how to use your tools. Yeah. And one of the things that we see, especially with with some poorly written or easily picked apart stories in like other mediums, whether it's movies and books, is when the writer just goes, you know, they just throw as many Deus Ex Machias and mm-hmm. crazy powers as they can. And then you're supposed to then write like the next story. Well, if you were introduced, you know, in mortality and invulnerability, how do you take that story from there and Hmm. what you were saying with Bayonetta is a really good example the end of the first game you I think literally punch a guy in the face and send (laughs) it into the sun sounds about right yeah I mean it's one of those things that if you've played Bayonetta it sounds off but then you play a game yeah that that probably did happen Mm -hmm. and then the challenge then is how do you essentially take that further and we've seen a lot of shows struggle again with how do you keep quote unquote upping the ante yes and you know there are so many tangents we could easily jump on with that one question well one that that occurs to me if if i may get into it is um uh, we spoke a bit earlier about silent hill i believe Um, Mm -hmm. maybe not the podcast but a pretty bit um and i have been reading uh recently in order to study up on on the genre and uh, for my my own work I'm about mm-hmm. to undertake. Uh, the comics of Junji Ito, who is a Japanese uh, manga artist, uh, comic writer, and famous for his horror comics, which some of which are nightmarish. They're awful. They're horrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that occurs to me is that uh, they work best for me, at least, when they are just one-offs. Um, or else you, you just focus on the one piece of horror. It's not this whole universe coming to an end, mm-hmm. all of that. I mean, sometimes it is, but that's only in the one story, you know. Mm-hmm. And focusing just one thing at a time, uh, Silent Hills, I, I think, does that well, where it's just mm-hmm. this one city and you're there and things have changed. The natural mm-hmm. has been replaced with something horrifying. Mm-hmm. You know, reality has, has taken a turn. And... Mm-hmm. The point being that it's about recognizing what the one thing you're going to do here is. And then in the next game, if you can up that a little bit more, go for it. Or else maybe try and find some other way to represent it or move on to the next element. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. Again, it's one of the things that we're seeing, especially a lot in today's entertainment medium with, obviously, the rise of Marvel Cinematic Universe, yes. DC, and... 
And there's only been these calls for the quote unquote, you know, the shared continuity or the shared universe where it's not just a story about Iron Man or the Hulk or whatever, but, you know, it's same place in the same place where the Guardians of the Galaxy are out there or mm -hmm. uh, the Avengers are doing something. And when you start throwing all these elements in, it's very easy for things to just get out of control. Yes. And I think what you said was a really good point about keeping like one off stories definitely help. You can do whatever you want and then the slate essentially gets wiped back to zero in a sense. But we've seen cases such as with Lovecraft where a lot of his stories there is a some of a shared mythos with the elder gods mm -hmm. and the things beyond our understanding but when it comes to the characters and the intimacy it's all one off we're not going to or very rarely will these characters basically come back again their story is told one time and then we move on to someone else's tale Yes, they're participating in, in the same world and the same horror. Mm -hmm. um, but ag again, it's the matter of that presentation. Or actually, um, one way I've, I've sometimes thought about it myself is that all stories are going to end the same mm -hmm. way, uh, either in, in death or in mm -hmm. um, just when the book closes and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what happens in the, in the middle is, is the interesting part. Yeah. Um, and if you just tell the same story over and over and over again, well, that's not going to be too fun for anybody. Mm -hmm. But when you make it, you know, have all of these different twists and different turns, and it is standing mm -hmm. on its own two feet and living its own life, that's where things get interesting. Yeah. And one of my favorite series of all time would be The Twilight Zone, which mm -hmm. is pretty much nothing but anthology stories. And they have to do a lot within their 30 minute and I think one season, an hour long frame and pacing, I think in structure is another fascinating topic. I mean, again, we could, I don't know how long <laughs> we could spend on each one of these long topics. Time. <laughs> yes, I guess. But this one, I guess this may be some of a tangent from our other narrative point of views, but I think this may also tie really well into Fallen One and Some of the Sea. As you said earlier in the cast cast, Ah, sorry, Cash. There is definitely a challenge with writing these stories in terms of pacing out the content. As you said, with Fall in London, you use the action systems to make sure that someone can't just run through an entire story in five minutes. With Sunless Sea, you, of course, have the ports and the geography of the landscape. So to essentially say, okay, you go here, then you're going to sail over here. Etc., etc., until the story is completed. I, from a narrative point of view, in terms of pacing, I guess for yourself as a writer, is there any measurement or any metrics that you go through to say this story is too short or this story is too long? Mm. Or is there just, or is there just like no real way of telling until you're you know, actually having people like read it or interact with it. No, I, I think there is a way. I mean, one thing that we do here when we write our exceptional stories is that we try to write them to be roughly 50 branches long. Mm -hmm. So we know what our budget is. And if we need to go over, we can go over. But in order to keep the wheels turning and produce the stories, because mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we sometimes say around here is that content is never finished. It's abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, we could be polishing things and rewriting and God knows we'd like to, <laughs> um, but we have to get them out the door. And so uh, to that end, we have a sense of how long the story is going to be. We know what our budget is and we know that, okay, so we start here. We're going to want to end here. Again, what happens in the middle? How does this play out? Mm -hmm. um, I will try and use my branches. Uh, I mean, sometimes content can feel shorter uh, than it might be. Uh, but we are lucky also in one aspect, which is that in Fallen London and Sun Sea, both they already exist in these very large, lush worlds. So maybe if we wanted to add a bit of pacing, we could say that the player has to go fight in uh, Wolfstack Docks in order to get some ropes to gold, or that they have to go to this other port to pick up um, something else. Um, even even the fail states uh, provide their own uh, bit of interest. 
in Fallen London, we have Minas states, so you could go to prison or you could go mad and enter the Royal Bethlehem Hotel, which is uh, an essentially a hotel for the insane, where you recover and you learn all sorts of interesting lore. Um, we call them fires in the desert, um, mm-hmm. not the Minas states particularly, but just that sense of we craft individual stories, yes. We know all of the beats between them. Uh, it could be that a player plays them exactly like that in sequential order, or it could be that they totter off for a while and live their own life. We can assume nothing at all about the character, uh, which makes things <laughs> sometimes a bit of a challenge. But we always try and make it so that the player has enough to do and that the story is satisfied within itself. I think that's probably the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really good point, Cash, about having a somewhat predefined limit. You said 50 branches per story. And again, when you're setting these kinds of limits up for yourself, it makes it easier to try and create this story and make it something that can be essentially compact in a sense. As you just said, you have no idea what the player is going to do. You could have someone, you know, rush through this story, you know, hit as many branches as mm-hmm. they can, let their actions reset, and then do it all over. Or you have someone say, okay, I'll do, you know, I'll do two branches right now, do my other things, and maybe I'll come back in a few days and do a few more. You just never know with these kinds of stories. Exactly. I mean, someone could go um, and say, sake of argument, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of this investigation about who this old waltzing duke is. But actually, right now, I want to go be a governor. I'm feeling, you know, my patriotic duty. Mm-hmm. So they'll hop on a ship and go to Port Carnelian, hopefully govern with good grace and um, acumen. Or maybe they'll go to prison because <laughs> they have been... I don't know, eating people, that seems to happen <laughs> with uh, some regularity, and they've been a bit too spotted, but um, we, we, we don't know anything about the character. I mean, again, though, they, they could be that good governor, or they could be uh, the cannibal who's trying to stain their soul in order to find uh, the name which should never be found. Mm-hmm. So, yep. And again, it's just a very interesting, when you're building it around a setting like Sunless Sea or Fall in London where it's not our real world. You can do almost anything within it. It takes on a whole different meaning when you're creating these just fantastical stories and plot lines for people to follow through. I I do think it is someone in the real world, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, London, uh some would argue was never actually stolen by bats <laughs> uh, in the year 1860 when Queen Victoria sold it uh, on behalf of her husband Albert. But I mean, I, I, do, I do think it, it's grounding in the world. Uh, it does give us the room and the reason uh, and the players to the, the space to enter into it. If it was completely alien, uh, they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. But because we are already playing to a player's supposition of what mm-hmm. Victorian manners are like, and we are allowing them to enter the uh, ground of... I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of my British compatriots, again, would not appreciate my, my talking about jolly old England. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, there is that sense of uh, tally-ho, that old American... Uh, understanding of what England is like, and I, I people bring to the experience their own thoughts and feelings, and that helps us make the world. That helps us more fully realize it than if it had been um, simply uh, fallen anything else. You know, some fallen made up city. Yeah, and I think you had a really good point there, Cash about grounding it in some sensibilities of the real world or the real London, it also allows you to define the rules of this world. Just so. And that's one of the uh, more important things. Um, and certainly something we are, I think I can say, um, considering as, as some of the skies comes up, is the rules of the world and the players' interactions uh, with them and how they may transgress mm-hmm. or abide by uh, the consequences of both. Yeah. 
And when you have, like, the lore set up around these rules, it allows, I think, for a much stronger storytelling. Because if you don't have that background, then you live in a setting where one week the world could end, the next week everyone becomes immortal. Mm -hmm. And while that may work for an anthology setting, as we said, with uh, Lovecraft, uh, horror or the Twilight Zone. If you're trying to tell like a long-standing narrative without a foundation, or what well, we hear from a lot of TV shows having a you know the Bible of their story, yes, it just seems to it can lead to that story just falling apart. Yes, and we do have one for uh, mm -hmm. for the Fallen London universe uh, rules that we maintain and never break, lest we bring down the <laughs> the angry wrath of our editor. Um, <laughs> But yes, I, I mean, it's something that, you know, since, since we've been speaking, that I've been considering as well, um, the intersection of uh, the player and the character, that mm -hmm. negative space. What I, I think games are more than the simple button inputs. It's, mm -hmm. it's more than Mario running. It's more than Link fighting Ganondorf. It's... Um, you know, uh, I, I think Gone Home is, is an interesting example. It's something I've been thinking on a little bit um, recently in how you start this game. You, you go into this house. It's abandoned. Your family seemingly disappeared. Um, when I first experienced it, I was quite worried. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was afraid. I thought it was going to be something very different than it turned out to be, as I think uh, it was built to be and, and most people know. And I do think that is in itself gameplay. Um, it's about creating, uh, at, at the risk of sounding very silly and flatty, which is uh, something of my mode, um, it, it's, I, I think game design in some ways is about creating a, a dream that the player enters into. It's about lulling them into a kind of sleep fantasy where if something really stands out as, you know, this actually doesn't make sense, this goes against uh, my, my will, or this um, feels a bit weird and not as responsive, you know, then you can have that suspension of disbelief broken. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can really lull them into a world, and even if it's just simple as walking around it or stamping the passports of Estrotska or, you know, walking Silent Hill or sailing on the sun the sea. Um, those are the moments of, of peace and quiet and in intersection where, where we can really make the game our own. Of course, it doesn't have to be that by itself. Um, the fluidity of Mario or Bayonetta, uh, going, going back to her, um, something that really pulls us into it and allows us to experience that as, as as our own and make of it something that it is not by itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a bit rambly and <laughs> probably a bit uh, absurd and going too far, but I, I am intrigued by, by, by that kind of mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And I think that's a good lead in to, I guess, one of our many topics. And that, again, is the intersection between the player and the player character. And the intersection between the player and the player character, even though that's our main topic, or what was going to be our main topic, we've certainly <laughs> touched on so many different aspects. There's, there's a lot to it. It's uh, mm -hmm. No lesson is universal. So. Yes. And one of the things that we were talking about before the cast that I wanted to bring up here, again, is the challenge of writing a character who is just the antithesis of the player we've seen games obviously go the hero's route where mm. the person has to do the right thing everything you know has to end right even when we have stories where you can play the quote-unquote bad guy as we've seen in, like the bioware rpgs mm -hmm. and other titles it's still kept within i guess the anti-hero kind of way you're still doing the right thing you're just more of a jerk about it yeah but one of the things that we were talking about before the cast is, could is it possible to write a story around an actual villain, around someone who is doing bad things not for the right reason? Or, as you were saying, Cash, around you know the fallen hero, a story that is not going to end happily when we get there. 
I never like to say that anything is impossible. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that perhaps we haven't found the way to some of those things quite yet. Um, and also on the note of, of the horror, possibly the, the market for it, I, I do think there would be, well, uh, let me, let me back up for a second on that. Um, mm-hmm. as regards to the horror, my primary wonder isn't whether or not it is possible to make a game where the player can be an outright villain. I think it certainly would be. Uh, my wonder though is how do you really make that interesting? Mm-hmm. How do you make it something that's not simply arbitrary? What does it yeah. mean to have the uh, player playing as a villain? Is mm-hmm. it to say that we are um, just telling them, you know, you push this button and you will you know, take the money from this old woman? Or is it mm-hmm. saying, oh, actually, you are going to make some very ugly decisions and these are going to be your decisions. We're going to bring you around to this, um, if, if that makes sense. How, how, how do you get the player to consent to performing a truly gruesome, uh, villainous mm-hmm. act uh, in, in a digital world beyond playing it for for a laugh or I, I suppose shock value we, we could fairly say would be there but how do, how do you get them to participate in that way yeah and that's definitely the challenge too because as we've seen with a lot of games released especially the Grand Theft Auto series it's hard to write these bad characters or these evil characters without it coming off as either being you know, just a bullet point on the box or something that is just there, I guess, to push buttons. Mm. Like, how do you write a character who's a villain without it coming off as, you know, the developer just trying to get a rise out of the audience? Like, just doing yes. something controversial for controversy's sake. I think the answer is sympathy. I think it's always going to be sympathy. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can understand... A villain who you can't understand is not going to, I think, be an interesting villain. Mm -hmm. Uh, A villain who you can understand plainly why they do it and say, actually, you know, maybe this is kind of uh, tempting, um, I I think is is more interesting. Uh, If if I could borrow, I kind of hate to borrow an example from from my own work Mm -hmm. again, but uh, there was, I mentioned earlier, where you and I must go, which is a story about how you're commissioned to find a corpse on a wreck, and this wreck mm-hmm. is on a living iceberg. And you go there with a very unwilling crew. And if you look at one of the qualities, you will notice that it says you have provisions for 14 days. Now, every uh, series of actions, you come to the end of a day on the lifeboat. And you have to calm down your crew. You have to make promises to them that they will be all right. You'll take care of their loved ones, etc. <laughs> um, but if if you really want to push it, if you say no, actually, I'm I'm wondering now what's going to happen. I see this quality says I shouldn't stay more than 14 days. What's going to happen if I do? Mm-hmm. Um, then you push your crew into greater fear, greater terror. They grow more upset by the day. They beg you and beg you to go. Um, and as you come to that mark, you will find a special option, which says you're out of food. You don't have anything here. Turn around now. Everything's okay. Or you can stay and see what happens. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail about what happens after that point if you elect like to stay with your crew. But I do wonder if that would fit your definition of a villainous action, something evil. I thought it was an interesting temptation. Um, and I think that's the closest I've come to realizing. And I'm trying to think of other examples in games. We spoke before the cast, I believe, about... Um, Oh, the one with the chicken on his head and he shoots the Russian mobsters. Uh, Hotline Miami. Yeah. Um, but but it, it, what? Well, what do you what do you make of of those two? If if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think you have a good point there about the sympathy sympathy side of things. And if it again, if it's just like a mindless creature, like we're playing like Jason Voorhees. Mm-hmm. 
then it's very hard. Obviously, you root from them from the horror point of view, mm -hmm. and we know that this is a horror setting. But if you're trying to do something where we're supposed to relate to this character in some way, shape, or form, yes. I think it does tend to fall apart without, again, having some kind of, I guess, human motivation or something yes. to say, why is this person doing this beyond just killing people or mm – -hmm. Uh, or, you know, like cannibalism or any of the, I guess, the quote-unquote taboos out there. Mm -hmm. If you're just making a story mm -hmm. of like 40 minutes of some guy walking around beheading people and there's nothing be else beyond that, it looks like, again, I think that will just be more of the shock value kind of design. Yes, yes and I, I suppose the question too is um – well, it's a silly question, but um, what would it look? What would it mean to have a game where you are offering to the player the the ability to do something mm -hmm. truly vile? Um, are they doing it strictly for the sock value? I think there's always going to be the answer. Yes, I think yeah. there's always going to be a group. Uh, and what does it mean if you get those people who you know sort of get into it a bit much? Or what does it mean if? Is it something that could be completed necessarily by um, individuals who, shall we say, aren't aren't on board with the villain? Mm -hmm. um, either they're disgusted by what they see, are they going to want to complete it? Uh, what would be their motivation? Uh, you always have to think of the player um, mm -hmm. in every circumstance. Uh, are they going to be removed from the experience entirely? How do you get them to invest in it? Do you? Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. And talking about getting invested and presenting these different options, I think a really good example of sort of this quandary or having these different viewpoints would be Undertale. Mm. Have you had a chance to play Undertale Cash? I have indeed. And um, obviously, for those of you who've played in, I'm going to have to slightly spoil it, but there are essentially two ways – well, there's more than two ways, but for our conversation, there's two. Yes. You can play the game normally as you would you know, a typical RPG, or for the extreme route, you can go the quote-unquote genocide ending, mm -hmm. and that is when you systematically wipe everyone out. And what they do – is as you go that route, the world starts to shift around the player. The music becomes more menacing. The descriptions become more gruesome in detail. And if you go full in, you get an ending where basically the game addresses you and basically condemns you for it's, you know that kind of over the top. And even if you're just watching it. And that's another very interesting point, what you were just mm. saying, Cash. There's going to be people who are going to play this strictly from a mechanic or outside perspective. Yes. They're not going to – they're going to do all this violent stuff, this over-the-top things, but they're doing it more to essentially test the game. They're yes. pulling it apart rather they're – essentially, they're seeing the forest for the trees in a manner of speaking. Hmm. Oh. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's um, actually one of the more the more interesting examples. Undertale and crossed my mind, but as soon as you said it uh, and spoke about the genocide, route, I do think that is absolutely uh, an example of. Well, I, I do wonder. It was a bit unfair to say um, if it is. I mean, players know what they're they're getting into there, yeah. so I do think it's fair. Uh, there's the element of consent. It's a bit of meta gaming because you really do have to go out of your way yeah. to to kill everyone in the genocide around as I understand. You have to keep walking around the areas and fighting the random encounters until there's no more left. Yeah. Um, but it does have that element of consent from the player. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think most, of course, are going to be doing it. From the perspective of the villain, ha ha ha, I'm going around mm -hmm. doing wicked deeds. Um, killing the monsters off, I think, is certainly one way that could easily appeal to any player. You know, this is just what we do. I'm doing this for a lark. And mm -hmm. the world of these very, very kind creatures is turning very much against me. They're all being very uh, hurt by what I'm doing. They're, they're expressing that. Um, but I'm going to keep on going anyway because I'm curious. And I do think that is... 
Yes, actually, I think that might be one of the mm-hmm. the, the better examples of it. <laughs> and I think um, what you were just saying, a Sengo cash regarding consent. I think that's another very interesting point. What if you're playing a game where the character wants to do something extreme, and as a player, you don't want that to happen? Do you give the player the right to essentially override that character, or do you essentially tell the player, you know? You're, if you're going to keep playing, you're going to have to be a mm. part of this. I think it depends on the story you're trying to tell mm-hmm. as much as anything in the world you're trying to create. I think that there are going to be uh, some instances where you're going to want to give the player that option. Uh, yeah, I think of a funny example, actually. I was talking a few days ago with a friend of mine at work uh, about – a misunderstanding that there was in The Wolf Among Us, where in The Wolf Among Us, one of the Telltale games, mm-hmm. you are attempting to extract information out of the woodsman, I believe, mm-hmm. and for those who haven't played it, the woodsman here is not the woodsman that we all know, of course. He's uh, a, bi- a bit of a con, and he knows that he isn't the great hero, mm-hmm. and he's expressing deep regret, and he's drunk out of his mind, but you need information out of him. So what you can do as uh, the big bad wolf who here is a detective trying to solve a murder case mm-hmm. uh, is sit in silence with him, you know, give him, give him that space. Or alternatively, there's an option to class him, mm-hmm. uh, which some people evidently thought meant to give him a glass of beer or some other friendly gesture instead of glassing him, meaning to hit him over the head with a bottle and, you know, tackle him to the bar and and start demanding answers. Um, So in that instance, it gave, uh, and throughout the whole game, really, the choice to be perhaps more villainous, more Mm -hmm. brutal uh, than you would be otherwise or else maintain that nature. And when that choice uh, was broken, uh, when it was misunderstood, it got people quite riled up Mm -hmm. um, in some instances. Yeah, and as another good example of that, we saw that with the Mass Effect trilogy mm. and the controversy surrounding the third game's ending, which people were expecting, you know, all the choices they made to be referenced into that final ending. And I'm sure as a writer for a narrative game, you know how crazy that yes. would have been to try and figure out. But I think you made a really good point there. If the player's actions, if you tell the player that if they do this, this will be the consequence, and then something else entirely happens, it's going to be seen as a chi. It will be sort of like, again, seeing like the man behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. Like This is not their story. This is the developer's story, and they're just you know along for the ride. Yeah, I had a really horrible uh, incident of that myself, actually, come to think of it, in L.A. Noir. When I had just found um, this man peddling drugs basically through slot machines. I had the hard evidence. I knew him mm-hmm. um, right behind him. You know, the slot machines, I had it all there. Go up, I confront him. And he says to me, you know, drugs, what drugs? I, I don't know anything about that. And I'm like, you're a liar. I've got you. I push the, mm-hmm. the, the hard counter button. And my character, uh, the detective in the game, he he slams his fist on the table and he gets in the guy's face and he yells, you know, don't you don't you be pulling me around here, you know, I know you're peddling drugs for the Jews. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> where did this come from? Jeez, no, sir, I am so sorry. That you know <laughs> just completely broke mm-hmm. me out of it. I'm like, sure, you know, you're free to go. I'm gonna go have a, a walk here <laughs> with a detective. Come on, detective, what on earth was that about? And I mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't get too much further in the game than that, mm-hmm. but um, mm-hmm. you know that uh, that instance there of you know mm-hmm. that's not what I I was expecting, and uh, I mm-hmm. guess you'd call it villainous. Um, mm-hmm. Probably be fair in its own right, but that uh, yeah, that was that was really bizarre. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of those kinds of issues when I've been playing some of the later games from Telltale, where. I want to try and say something, but the answer that I want to say that which would make sense in the situation yes. is not one of those options. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that really pulls you out of the story, especially if you're trying to give the player the quote-unquote freedom 
to tell that story when it seems like again that everything that I do really doesn't matter Mm -hmm. it becomes hard to relate to these characters and i think this goes back to what we were saying a few minutes ago with trying to humanize characters so you can at least relate to them in some sense but when that control is taken away from you it just ruins it and um one other example i think i also really enjoyed the wolf among us and from a narrative i'm sorry i was just saying it's a fantastic game yes yeah And one of the elements I really liked, I would like to see more games explore, is the fact that you're playing this character who, as we all know, the big bad wolf is about violence. He's supposed to be the monster that comes in and destroys everything. And you have to play the game, you know, you have to basically see how far you're willing to keep him from succumbing to his basic instincts. And I would love to see more games explore that kind of element, like the uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde Mm -hmm. kind of point of view, like how long do you keep yourself from being, from relishing in the fact that you could just go up to someone and beat the crap out of them if they say anything bad about you, but can you keep yourself from doing that? Like, I'm surprised we haven't seen more games try to go like that, what the original concept of the Incredible Hulk was. You know, smart man, who's more on the passive side, or raging brute who's going to destroy everything around him. Well, it does occur to me that there may be one example uh, where mm-hmm. this was attempted and did not altogether work out, uh, which is Bioshock. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you, the city of Rapture, the little sisters. Yeah. Do you uh, harvest them and make your mm-hmm. time easier, or do you spare them because they're little girls, monstrous though they may be? Um, mm-hmm. Which... I think it's 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 a weird choice in its own right because yeah. it's it seems to me that's not really a choice. It's do you kill the little girls or do you yeah. not? And that's a bit too cut and dry. Uh, there are possible other ways, but I you know I'm, I'm not going to bad rap Bioshock. I loved it to death and still do, mm-hmm. but um, you know your your own hide versus mm-hmm. innocents who are just doing their best to get by or. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a matter of just finding the right formula more than more than anything else. I think it's absolutely mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. And I think with Bioshock, definitely a fascinating. That's a good hour discussion easily right there. I think between the two of us, yes. and I think the problem with that, and this this is another topic again plus hour easily going into, is when you start combining narrative with gameplay Mm. and we've been sort of talking about this all throughout this cast but when it comes down to it one of the challenges of a video game is the fact that there has to be a mechanic or some kind of um, interaction element with the player now when you're writing like a visual novel story you're just you know moving to like the next uh, paragraph or you'll just change the story but when you're playing a game like Grand Theft Auto or L.A. Noir or even Bioshock, the added gameplay element adds a completely different or another layer of complexity to it. Uh, for instance, as we said with the little sister harvesting, it comes down to if you do this, it will make the game easier. You'll get more powers. You'll be able to, the mm-hmm. game will become cooler for you. But if you don't do it, then it, you save them, but then there is the added balance of the fact that for those of you who play Bioshock, you may remember that in the long run, you'll get more Atom or the resource you need to enhance your tonics and use more powers. You'll get more of that by saving the little sisters. So the game is essentially passively telling you the good option is always good. It may not be the best one in the short run, but for people who want to play the game the most or get further in, it's better to go that route. And I think this goes back to our the challenge we were talking about a few minutes ago. When you're trying to tell the player to do something evil, how do you convince them from a mechanic point of view to try and get them to do that? We've seen in the Bioware games, for instance, you know, the light side, dark side points. Mm. And but then that just comes off again as being very gamey. 
yeah. then you can say, oh, I'll kill these three people, but I'll donate to the charity over here, and that will give me, that will bounce mm-hmm. back my light side points. You know, or the, the Fallout Karma system or mm-hmm. any of these. I mean, it, the question is always going to be, how do you, I, I think there needs to be, or rather, I would like to see there be explored a system of morality, which is not simply a system of, of morality. I, I mm-hmm. think that ultimately can grow quite dull because it's, you know, don't mm-hmm. kill people, don't steal from them. Um, whereas I think what Bioshock did attempt was was quite interesting, even if it failed, um, mm-hmm. which is focusing it really on the theme of the game, which is uh, the fall of this unbridled capitalism and um, objectivism, you know, of, of Ayn Rand, who, you know, do you do this for yourself? Is it all for yourself to survive, to get by, to do all of this? Mm-hmm. Um, or I, I think to one of the titles that I try, that I wrote uh, in order to uh, get into Fail Better, I, I had to write a couple of narrative driven games. And one of them, attempted to use a series of um, choices which was not based around uh, good and evil as such, but of mm-hmm. idealism and practicality, framing it in that way. The framing things is is always, I think, uh, one of the most important parts of the game. That's how you're mm-hmm. presenting your choices, how you're building your world for your, your player to enter into. Yeah. And so it wasn't just a matter of, you know, is it good to do this but you know is is it practical can you afford to Mm -hmm. right now is there really going to be that bad of a consequence if you don't well if you do you're going to you know suffer it's it's Mm -hmm. not going to be an easy route for you maybe it'll pay off but you know there's no guarantee and sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't yeah and i think that kind of consequence is a major factor in when you get beyond just saying good and evil because we all know what good is we all know what evil is stealing is bad um, helping people is good. We that has already been established long before any of us have gotten here. But when you start framing it within the consequences and the responses in the game, I think that's where things become more interesting. It goes back to some of those classic expressions: "Do you do the right thing for the wrong reason, or the wrong thing for mm. the right reason?" Just so. um, I just lost my train oh, of thought there, sorry, but sorry, no, that's sorry. all right. No, I was just saying it. Oh, good. Uh, let, let me take a quick sip of water. May that will re that may that will re-energize me. There we go. Um, and one of the things, an example I want to bring up: Have you ever played or heard of the game series Shin Megami Tensei by any chance? Cash? I I certainly know of it. I have. To my my unhappiness, not played it. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. <laughs> Same with The Witcher, actually, which yeah. which occurred to me there for for a moment as you were speaking about uh, the world and the consequences. And I think The Witcher yeah. does enter into that. But again, yeah, that's another one I definitely want to touch on. But with Shimagami Tensai, what they do, they have a morality system in the game, but instead of framing it as good or an evil, they use order or law chaos and neutral okay and what they do is law represents conformity it means you know putting yourself putting the group in front of yourself you know everyone has a place and everything must be within that place if Mm. you trying to stand out or be above someone else you know that's wrong in this world and then chaos is, you know, pure Darwinism. You know, might makes right. If you're stronger, mm-hmm. then you're more right than everyone else. You're only as good as you're able to, you know, keep these people from overcoming you. And what they do, and the neutral, of course, is you're between the two. And they never say which way would be considered right. They show what happens at the two extremes, but the game never just you know, stops and says, well, you know, law is good. Law is superior. You know, you should always be lawful, stuff like that. There's always those elements of the shades of gray. And taking that with The Witcher, I think that's another really good example. Uh, From the first Witcher game, you're in this world that it's a world of definitely gray in terms of how these people react and do things. I remember a quest early on when you're supposed to 
stop people from harassing elves, mm -hmm. which in the Witcher world, the fancy creatures are basically treated as second and third class citizens. Right. There's rampant racism all throughout. So the idea is, oh, well, I'm going to save these elves. I'm going to make them be better. And then you find out later on that the elves were part of a terrorist group and they just killed a bunch of innocent people. Hmm. And then it's like, well, you know, did I – was there a right action there? And if you get to the end of the game and staying neutral, one of the things that I thought that really struck with me was the fact that they say that, yes, you didn't go out and do anything outright good or bad, but because of your inaction – more people were killed because of mm -hmm. how lengthy things were drawn out rather than if you would have just picked a side and said, oh, I'm going to be with the humans or I'm going to be with the fancy creatures, it would have ended more peacefully. There still would have been bloodshed, but again, it goes the back to the of conflict would have made it. Yeah, exactly. And it's these kinds of choices, again, that they're not framed within just flat out good or bad. There's layers to these choices and again what you were saying cash there's repercussions what are these things going to do can i afford to do them and will it come back in some way down the line yes. and one thing that strikes uh, me too with that example is something that we sometimes encounter uh, in some feedback on some of the forums with some of the exceptional stories which is um the the question of neutrality and the question mm -hmm. of um, playing good and it, making people friends, as it were. Not everyone's going to be friends. That's the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do you... What happens if, if you do create this conflict where you have these two sides who... Mm -hmm. Ugliness is in both camps and the basis of their conflict is unfortunate and sad. And mm -hmm. can't we all just get along? Well, no. You, no. you, you may just <laughs> have to pick one side and stick to it. And if you don't, as we see here... Um, and the consequences may still be as dire, if not more dire, mm -hmm. instead of having, you know, just picked one side, even if it is a difficult decision. Um, mm -hmm. yep. which is, and, yep. mm, I was just going to say, which is, I suppose, another topic onto itself, which is how do you oblige a player into a very difficult decision mm -hmm. and position? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think Telltale can succeed in that because of how swiftly their stories move and the fact that they are all, all they are all uh, events where you have to decide things in the moment as they play out in real time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's yeah. something else I know we, we think about a lot here in office is how do you create conflicts that the player can mm -hmm. be satisfied in and challenged by both at the same time, which is not always something that happens. Yeah, and... That's. I think that will probably take us to the final point for this cast. Because again, who knows how long we could talk for? I think Fair there's just time. so many topics here. But with regards to again that getting the player to do something, that I think is the one of the hardest elements. Because and it goes back to what we were saying with like the quote unquote taboo. How do you write a story and how do you convince a player to go through a story like this if you're playing as someone who's going around and killing innocent people? Again, we talked about the humanizing element that helps to some extent, but um, I'll give you a small example. There's Breaking Bad mm -hmm. and how Walter White, of course, became a drug dealer slash drug lord. And I know for a lot of people, even though there is that human element to him, there were some choices that he made that it completely turned people off from those stories. Doesn't matter, you know, what happened later, but he did something in their eyes that was just completely unredeemable in a sense. And it does raise that question. When you're trying to tell these stories, what if – like, is there a way to get people to do this? And as we said, like what we just said with the Witcher example or with conflicts, sometimes you have to make a choice. But how do you convey that to a player without, as we've said, without just doing it for controversy's sake? How do you make it so it's not just something shock value, you know, that you're just trying to, you know, mm. make someone be angry or, you know – 
trying to offend them on purpose, in a sense. So do you mean, uh, just to make sure I, I answer it as best I can, uh, when you ask how we figure out which options to present a player, do you mean specifically to make them content in the sense of freedom we are purveying to them, or do you mean to lead them down what might be a very dark road to a very unhappy choice? I want to say down the dark road there where even though, you know, no matter what they do, it's still going to come out in some way being bad. Like, uh, as we said, with the example of playing as a villain, that no matter how well you play this character, no matter if you're trying to be on the up and up, this character is still going to go up to an innocent person and stab them in the mm. back or do something even more deplorable. Well, I, I, I think it... Depends on the story, of course, you're trying to tell. Um, in Fallen London, and it's on the CNR universe, uh, cannibalism is, I mean, it's a bit funny. I mean, it's always a bit mm-hmm. funny, but that is something that we don't really ever have to push people too much into. <laughs> a lot of them are quite happy to go out and seek it for themselves, though not always. Um, one way is to create circumstances where where it is required. In some of the sea, for instance, you can run out of you can run out of food, and mm-hmm. that's that's what happened at sea uh, in real life. Very often, uh, distressingly often, is that if you run out of food, you're going to have to stay alive somehow. If you can't find mm-hmm. any fish, you can't do anything. Well, here's your choice is what you might have to do to survive. Are you willing to do that, or are you going to go down with your ship? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think it depends. I think... You could create the circumstances around the character, uh, which, if self-contained, could work, as, as we discussed earlier. Um, Fall in London and Sun the Sea both, I think, have a particular challenge in that they exist in such a large universe mm-hmm. that the character is already coming in and the player is already coming in with a sense of history and a sense of other kinds of possibility, where if... You know, they had been forced into it otherwise or uh, in, a, in a smaller setting, uh, it might be more successful. I think back again to Heavy Rain, um, mm-hmm. which had, you know, some horrible choices that you had to, to make in the, in the moment. Uh, I think back to some of the trials. Uh, are you going to kill this drug dealer to save your son? Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I, I think you have to build the the sympathies. You have to lead them by the hand. A lot of horror stories I've I've noticed don't just start with everything wrong. They unfold over time. Things start to turn and twist and change, and the world we knew is all of a sudden not the one that we're in anymore and certainly not the one we want to be in. And that's what we have to try and do is lead the player down this path to say, okay, well, you're making these small concessions. You're doing these things. Now you know where you're coming from. You know what your motivations are. You know what you have to do. Are you willing to go this far? And I think maybe that's the question that we need to ask uh, if we want to push the players into doing something awful is, is how far are you willing to go? And then frame the motivation around that. Mm-hmm. I guess as a final question, and to sort of follow up on what you just said, Cash, do you think it is right or that you should offer the player a quote unquote out? As you said, uh-huh. with the example you said a few minutes ago regarding like having two sides of a conflict, what is it? Would you offer the player a third option to say, you know, just walk away? Just, you know, I don't want to deal with either of these people. Just let them kill each other or whatever. I don't want, you know, this on my conscience. Uh, the answer to every question, I think, is always it depends. Uh, and certainly, <laughs> I'm the, the, the story I want to tell. We just had one, uh, which I, I, I think is a very fine story. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Our Lady of the Pyres by, by James. It's our current exceptional story of, of the month of October. And it, it does have this kind of situation that we've been talking about of uh, in this instance, it's two cultists, uh, two cults on one island, both vying for power. Um, mm-hmm. And the options are to side with one cult, side with the other cult, or work to bring the destruction of them both. Um, mm-hmm. There are some people who wanted to 
make them all friends or who wanted to try and minimize loss on both sides. And, um, you know, in some instances, we just don't have the resources to tell every side of the story. Content debt is a very real thing. It does build up very mm-hmm. fast. There's only so much uh, any creator can do with with the time they have, no matter how good they are. Um, and there was talk of should there be an out option, and you know, so that's just that's just life, really. Mm-hmm. You know, you you can try and do something, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, you you have your options, and you play them as best you can. I I think the options were given were very fair, um, and I think that's that's what it has to be. Uh, they have to be fair options. And if it's really a story that the player just doesn't want to play, they don't want to be met with these options, I suppose the option then is for them to not engage with it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but again, this is a – the topics that we're talking about are those that, you know, they are definitely multi-layered. There's so many different ways we can approach things, especially not just from a storytelling point of view, but again, from a gameplay and – what you're trying to show the player. I think one of the key points that we've touched on is you need to probably tell the player about why these choices have to be in there. Why? What are the repercussions? Again, going back to what we we're saying, that's not just controversy for controversy's sake, that there is a reason, there's a thematic element to why this needs to happen. Exactly so. I mean, one way I try and phrase it is is that a, a good choice is a bit like a present. Um, I think the best presents are ones you didn't even know you wanted. And mm-hmm. when trying to design stories, that's the way I try and approach it is what is it the player doesn't even know they want to do that I can I can let them do. Yes. This has definitely been a fascinating conversation with you, Cash. And I, for those of you listening to the cast who are still hopefully awake and haven't fallen asleep at us talking, uh, this is another one of those great conversations where if it wasn't for real life and for you folks hopefully still awake, we could just sit here and chat for who knows how many hours. But I think it is time to start to wrap things up. And Cash, definitely if you're free in the future – Love to have you and oh, anyone else from Fail Better on because I mean, uh, we've spoken to I've spoken to Chris several times, mm-hmm. and that was during the era where we used to have like three or like two and a half hour <laughs> long casts. So we can easily, I'm sure, if we had um, two or three of you from Fail Better, that could be like a day's worth of I'm podcasting sure. right there. Very easily arranged. I know I've had an absolute delightful time speaking to you, and I know people here are. Uh, eager to do the same, you know, but I've been mm-hmm. the envy of the office. So mm-hmm. awesome. So to wrap things up, Cash, again, thank you so much for coming on. By the time you're listening to this cast, obviously, the Submariner expansion should be out. So I hope I wish you the wish you and the rest of Fail Bear the best of luck with that. I hope thank you very it good. gets really good impressions from everyone. I think it'll do very well. It's a it's a beautiful game. Awesome. And Definitely, um, if you guys have time, we would love to do another live play with you guys with the expansion, show it off. And yeah, when the time comes and you're and you're ready to talk about Sunless Skies, definitely I'll be here waiting to uh, pick your brain about that. Absolutely. All right. So before we say goodbye, as I always ask at the end of these casts, oh do you have any final thoughts or anything you would like to say to the fans listening? Any you know, just thoughts? something to tie a ribbon on. Oh dear. Uh, hope forever. <laughs> live the dream. Uh, <laughs> you know, all, all of that good stuff. No. Um, if if I wanted to try and give a, a tiny takeaway is, or a thought to to chew on is, uh, w- w- what is gameplay? Is it just the inputs? What is the player experience? How do you build that? How do you sucker them into your uh, delightful fantasy or horrible fantasy? Um, mm-hmm. I, th- I think that's something that, that's really worth considering. Yeah. And my goodness, we have so many topics we could talk about today. Until, until, until it's uh, morning here and morning there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
But I think with that, we're going to wrap things up again, Cash. Thank you so much for coming on. And, yep, definitely don't be a stranger. I think Absolutely. we can easily – who knows how many more casts we have, just the two of us. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> awesome. So for those of you still awake and listening, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Percepta Podcast. I hope you enjoyed things. And as always, if you'd like to support Game Wisdom, we have multiple options available. If you'd like to be a future podcast guest, a guest on my new weekly live show, or write a piece for the site, you can find information and links on the front page under Submissions Wanted. We are always looking for new people to talk to. And as you are no doubt aware, we can have a lengthy conversation <laughs> about just about anything. So be sure to get in touch with me. That's josh at game-wisdom.com. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitch under GW Bicer for updates of new content and thoughts from me throughout the day. Be sure to check out our daily Twitch stream most nights at 10 Eastern channel GW Bicer. And of course, be sure to check out the, seems like we are really growing now, Game Wisdom YouTube channel, where you'll find daily videos of Let's Plays, Game Spotlights, and my daily vlog talking game design topics. Last but not least, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. Any donations would be greatly appreciated in order to allow us to keep going and growing. If we can hit some goals, it will mean not only being able to support myself and my household, but we can add more content for everyone to enjoy. So with all that said, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Perceptive Podcast. Have a great rest of the day, wherever you may be. <laughs> and we will talk to you again next time. Take care. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, share with your friends. It always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GW Bicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.